Okay. Just as unbelievable as me too. Utam Lal Rosbandari, known to most of us as merely as Tom. Tom grew up in Nepal, spent his early years there in his elementary education in Nepal. And he got his early collegiate education at the, in Nepal as well, a college that was associated in Nepal with the University of Patna in India. So he received his bachelor's degree in 1952 from the University of Patna and then uh, enrolled uh, in the master's program at the University of Calcutta in India and received a, a Master of Science degree there in uh, 1955. <clears throat> he then immigrated to uh, England and began his PhD work at uh, King's College at the University of Durham under the mentorship of uh, Jim Baddeley. Uh, I knew Baddeley quite well at that time because of our mutual interest in coenzyme A, uh, although I didn't know Tom at that time. <laughs> uh, Thomas already, when he introduced me, said that he knew of me at that time at least. <laughs> <laughs> he got his uh, PhD in 1962 and then immediately came to this country to work with Gobin Karana who at that time was at the Enzyme Institute at the University of Wisconsin. So Tom joined Gobin at the University of Wisconsin, and two years later, 1964, Tom was made a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin. In the late 1960s, we here at MIT were trying very hard to recruit Gobin Karana to come here to MIT. And we were able, finally, to, uh, to get him to agree to come here. But as a bonus, we also convinced Tom to come along as well. And that was a real bonus for us. So Tom arrived here in 1969 uh, and became a faculty member here in the biology department. In 1969, uh, Vernon Ingram and I had been teaching general biochemistry together for about 10 years. And <clears throat> shortly after Tom arrived, uh, he took Vernon's place in this course uh, and took over the teaching in, of uh, uh, nucleic acid biochemistry and protein structure. This is the areas that v Vernon had been teaching. I had been teaching uh, enzymology and, and metabolism in the general course, 705, as if you all remember. And <clears throat> So he took over for Vernon at that time. Uh, and for the next 20 years or so, Tom and I taught that course together, 705. And of course, we got to know each other very, very well uh, during that period of time. Um, <clears throat> not only were we teaching colleagues, but it turns out that somewhere along the line, because of some interest that uh, in my own laboratory having to do with uh, how uh, the enzymatic uh, methylation of uh, nucleic acid takes place. Uh, we got, uh, Tom and I got entangled in research as well. So uh, we not only became close colleagues, teaching colleagues, but we came, became at that time research colleagues as well. <clears throat> well, not only did we become good research and teaching colleagues, but we also, we also became very good personal friends. And that friendship has ex extended right up until the present time. And it is a real pleasure this morning for me to introduce uh, Tom Rajbandari to you, where he will tell you about his, whatever, whatever he's asked to tell you. Uh, be sure and ask him, be sure somebody asks him uh, about his early years in Nepal. <laughs> okay, Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for, the, for your kind, kind, kind words. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Gene, as always, is very kind. And I, I think I have one of the things that I've really, really enjoyed about being at MIT is the 
opportunity to have colleagues like Jean and everybody here, and also to collaborate with people uh, uh, over the years. So that's been really wonderful. So uh, what can I tell you about my early years in Nepal? Manda wanted me to say a few words. So let me, <laughs> let me just uh, digress here. Uh, I grew up uh, in a family with uh, nine uh, of nine brothers and sisters. I was the oldest son. And uh, you know, in Nepal, uh, uh, is, is, well, I grew up in the valley of Kathmandu. And the valley is approximately 10 miles by 12 miles. And uh, at that time, had a population of about 150,000, I think. It's swollen immensely now. Uh, it had only one college. The, all of Nepal did not have a university. It had one college in Kathmandu, which is two miles from my house. And that's where I got my education, a college education. But before that, I also went to school locally. And uh, I have to confess to something here. I really spent only five years at school. Much of my education was really at home through tutors. My father wanted me to have a good, good background. So he hired people to teach me English and geography and Sanskrit. And, and all the stuff. But mostly, these, many of them were actually not hired so much. That they were actually my cousins, uh, cousins who really were good geographers, or cousins who really knew mathematics and things like that. So that was really wonderful to learn from them. I spent only five years at school. Uh, and then I went to college. Uh, now, you know, many of you here, I think, you know, you, at the age of 10 or 12, you knew exactly what you wanted to be. Uh, that was not uh, the case with me. I had no clue as to what I wanted to be. But the expectation was that I was the oldest son and that you know you would, you would go into a profession that would earn money and actually and help the family, right? So, and the only profession one could think of is a medical profession. Be a doctor and you know, be famous, earn money. Uh, so I went to college, and in the system is that you know, to get a bachelor's degree, you get two years to get a, you know, what's called an intermediate in science, and then two years uh, after that to get a bachelor's. And uh, when I finished my intermediate in science, I found out that I had neglected to take botany and zoology, that it was necessary for you to get into medical school. So either I had to stay one more year and take botany and zoology or move on. And what did I do? I moved on. I moved on and decided to just get a bachelor's degree in science with physics, chemistry, and mathematics, which is what I did. Uh, and I was fortunate to do well enough that at that time, uh, you know, the, some of the older colonies, India, Pakistan, Ceylon, all those things, you know, the Britain had pulled back. And so there was, uh, they formed a union called, uh, they actually had a plan to help each other. They still were part of the British Commonwealth. They formed a plan to help each other through something called the Colombo Plan. The Colombo Plan because you know, they, they met in Colombo, in Ceylon, at that time Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. And so they decided to help each other through you know, establishing scholarships and things like that. And although Nepal was never a part of the British Commonwealth because it was not colonized by Britain, they somehow felt that Nepal was a needy country and that they would want to, want to help us. So there were two or three scholarships to people from Nepal. And I was, I was fortunate enough to get one of those to go to, uh, to Calcutta to do my master's in uh, chemistry. And you know, there, uh, uh, unfortunately, I fell ill, so I lost a year. Uh, and then I went back again in 53 uh, and just basically uh, finished uh, my degree in chemistry. Uh, taking physical, inorganic, and organic chemistry. So I'm a chemist throughout. You know. uh, but then, uh, fortunately, again, I did well enough there that I got a scholarship to go to uh, Britain, the Colombo Plan Scholarship again. Uh, and uh, I had no say as to where I went. You know. I mean, just the, the people decided for me as to where I should go. <laughs> all, all they wanted to know was what they wanted to do. I said, I, you know, I majored in organic chemistry, so I'll do organic chemistry. And then I was sent to Jim Badley's lab. And Jim had uh, uh, done his work, his chemist had done his work with Alexander Todd, who was a professor of chemistry at Manchester and then at, at Cambridge. And Todd, as some of you might know, got the Nobel Prize, became well known. He was in the House of Lords and et cetera, et cetera, in England. So Badley uh, had done his uh, work with Todd, postdoc uh, somewhere in Sweden. 
uh, then spent a year in Lippmann's lab, which is, I think, where he got his interest in coenzyme A, that Gene was talking about, and spent some years at the Lister Institute in, in uh, London. And then he got the professorship in Newcastle. And that's where I was sent, to Newcastle. Now, the time I went to Newcastle, was, you know, it was kind of time of much international tension. It was kind of almost, if you were superstitious, you might say it was ominous. Because Britain and France had just invaded the Suez Canal. Uh, the Russians were threatening to bomb Britain uh, at that time. This is 1956. And, uh, and I was on my way to Britain. Uh, uh, so, uh, so off I went anyway. Uh, I remember vividly the, 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 uh, the airports that we had. No, there's no direct connection between Kathmandu and London, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and we flew in an old DC-3, the only uh, planes that you could fly from Kathmandu to Delhi. And then from Delhi, I remember all the stops in you know, Karachi, Pakistan, Tehran, uh, Basra in Iraq, Istanbul in Turkey, Frankfurt in Germany, and then London. Or the British Overseas. Uh, no, no, it's British Overseas Airlines Corporation. <laughs> so BOAC at that time, just 1956. Got to Newcastle and started working with Badley. And uh, uh, it was the, the, my thesis project was synthesis of coenzyme A. And that's really where I had to read a lot of literature on coenzyme A. I came across Gene's early work with Esmond Snell on pantothenic acid, pantothene, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and there, I think, uh, you know, I learned synthetic chemistry uh, and uh, peptide chemistry, sulfur chemistry, nucleotide chemistry, and things like that, which I think, you know, really was the beginning of my scientific career, I have to say. I, you know, uh, that really was a, a steep learning curve for me. But, uh, it was, but then at the end of three years, when, uh, what happened was before I finished my project, which is synthesis of coenzyme A, someone else synthesized it. And, <laughs> and that's someone else. It was Gobind. <laughs> right? Uh, so Gobind had a student named John Moffat, and John synthesized uh, coenzyme A. So my thesis title became Studies in the Synthesis of Pyrophosphates rel Related to Coenzyme A. <laughs> so anyway, but I, I, then I had the choice, Badly said, OK, so uh, you can do one of two things. Either you can write a thesis, and uh, then you can, uh, he also thought that I should stay there as a, a, a postdoctoral fellow. And I uh, had already interviewed for an ICI fellowship and an MRC fellowship, and I got the MRC fellowship. And so I had a choice of either writing my thesis and then staying on for the fellowship, or I wanted to go home for a while. So I went, to, went home, back to Nepal for two months. And when I came back, instead of writing my thesis, Badly said, well, you know, uh, we're running into some competition here. Uh, on another project that he was working on, Badly had discovered uh, molecules called tyquic acids. And tyquic acids are these polymers in bacterial cell walls, gram-positive bacteria have these type cell walls, polymers. And so, and he was running into competition from Jack Strominger here. And so I said, okay, so I'll, I'll do that. And uh, so I did that, work on that project for three years. Learned, a, once again, learned a lot about, uh, again, uh, phosphate chemistry, uh, amino acid chemistry. But although it was all chemical work, the, all the analytical techniques that we used were all really biochemical. You know, this chromatography, electrophoresis, colorimetric analyses, and things like that. So that really got me interested more in biochemistry at that time, that, and moved from biochemistry uh, to biochemistry. And then when uh, Badley got a letter from Gobind, asking for you know, people from his lab who might want to do postdoctoral work. And Badley came and asked me, well, are you interested in working with government? <laughs> well, I said, yeah, <laughs> of course. So, so then that's how, what brought me to Wisconsin. And again, that time was another ominous time, because there was, that was a time of Cuban Missile Crisis. And again, you know, Russians threatening uh, America with all kinds of stuff, and I was on my way to America. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I remember again, you know, took the uh, took the uh, boat uh, Queen Mary from Southampton uh, to New York. Uh, left uh, uh, my wife and a six-month-old child uh, because you know I wanted to get settled and have an apartment before they came over. Yeah. And. 
had never, never really experienced seasickness in my life, <laughs> and did. <laughs> and arrived in New York, uh, uh, the doctors were on strike. I had no clue how to do. You know, uh, when doctors are on strike, you have to handle your own luggage and things like that. And I came with quite some luggage. Uh, but anyway, so it was it was a struggle. I stayed at the YMCA for one night. Uh, shipped all the stuff to Madison. Somebody helped me ship all the stuff to Madison. Then the next day, I took the train to Madison. And when I got to Gobin's lab, I was absolutely thrilled to know that Gobin wanted to, me to work on transfer RNA, sRNA at that time called transfer RNA because you know I thought that I really. Uh, was very interested in uh, generally in questions of structure and function. And here was a class of molecules that had you know, been discovered just a few years ago, and which obviously played a very important role in protein synthesis. So that's really what you know, uh, led me to work on transfer RNAs, and I have stayed with that and translation ever since. Uh, so I think and at Madison was a very, very exciting place to be. Because at that time, again, you know, this is 62, was the heydays of molecular biology. Right? You know, there were some very young people there uh, who had just been hired, uh, people like Hatch Eccles, uh, Bill Dove. These are really, really well-known guys in the field of you know, uh, lambda uh, genetics and biology. Julius Adler was there. Uh, Masayasu Nomura had just been hired. Chuck Curlin had just been hired. And really a wonderful place to be and where I learned a lot from just being uh, uh, with these people. And, uh, Learn to grow 150 liters of lambda uh, uh, <laughs> infected cells, and actually, you know, isolating lambda phase. You know, we centrifuges in you know, a day and night centrifuges. You know, you can imagine banding cesium chloride banding uh, of phages from 150 liters of culture. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was a good experience. It was, uh, and uh, and then, as Gene said, you know, I uh, uh, got into a, a faculty. I was a, a appointed a faculty member there. Uh, didn't have to teach much. Uh, I just have to give four lectures a year, and this was a, 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 a multi-team uh, taught course. Uh, again, uh, molecular biology oriented, but I my lectures were mostly chemical, nucleic acid chemistry and synthesis. Uh, uh, types of lectures. So I enjoyed the, my time immensely there, seven years. Uh, very difficult place to leave because it's a lovely, lovely, lovely uh, uh, city, uh, great university, lakes all over, and uh, children were happy. But then, you know, when MIT uh, came, there was no choice. <laughs> no choice but to come here. And I think I have really enjoyed being here ever since. 1969 is when we came. And it's been 38 plus years, not year 39 now. And over the years, you know, wonderful colleagues, you see many of them here. Uh, uh, and uh, just, uh, just been fabulous. I've collaborated with, my first collaboration was with uh, Harvey Lodish. Uh, and this was uh, uh, work done by uh, David Hausman. Yeah. David Hausman was at that time a student enrolled at Brandeis, but working in Harvey's lab. And so David uh, uh, and I collaborated, and we published a paper. The very first paper I published from MIT was with, with Harvey. Yeah. And then we collaborated with Gene. With Gene had just come back from Caltech, I think, uh, with working with Atardi on a sabbatical and uh, 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 working with the meth uh, RNA methylases. And so we used those enzymes to introduce methylations into tRNAs and look to see whether what the effect was on structure and function and things like that. Uh, collaborated with Gobind over the years. Alex, Phil Sharp, uh, and uh, several others, really. And so it's been a wonderful time of collaboration, uh, camaraderie, teaching, and you know I think uh, taught with Gene. Then went on to teach uh, molecular biology with, uh, first with Barbara for a year and then with Alan Grossman. Uh, then taught introductory biology with one of many people, David Hausman, David Page, Eric Lander. Uh, and uh, 
Now, then taught introdu uh, introductory lab course 702. And now I have the privilege of teaching 725, uh, a new course, completely new course, right now, uh, uh, so with Boris Magasani. Uh, so, so that's that's where things stand, and uh, I will answer questions to the best of my ability here. So I have asked him to stop for 30 minutes, but he's calling his boss to say he can stop. Okay. <laughs> but you can hear me, right? I'll I'll try to yell. Okay, yeah. Nobody, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. So, how, uh, numerous siblings end up go, uh, going to the uh, West also. Can you repeat the question? Okay. Did any of my numerous siblings end up going West? Uh, the only one who did was, uh, uh, for a few years, was my sister. My sister went to Germany to study archaeology. And so that was, you know, I think, the, again, through scholarships that the Germans uh, provided. And uh, she uh, went back uh, to Nepal, and she, you know, she was just. What did, you, what did your father? <clears throat> my father, yeah. Well, my father was a civil servant. Now, he was uh, in the customs department. He eventually rose to be the director of customs, uh, uh, and was that for many, many years. But it's really, I have to kind of say that uh, my father was my guiding light, really, because I think from him I learned, you know, if you're a custom, if you are a chief of customs in Nepal, you can make a lot of money. You can make a lot of money. And yet, we did not. He was, you know, just, you know, just in terms of honesty and integrity and all that, really, you know, uh, and keeping one's word. Uh, so he was my guiding light. And he, he, he was a civil servant, lowly at the time I was a student, but then he eventually rose up to be, to be the chief of customs. In, yeah. So how did your family take it when you didn't become a doctor? Uh, I think, they, did, I think they, they took it okay because I was doing something else. But I think what really shocked me was the fact that I did not go back to Nepal. Uh, because actually, I have to tell you that when we moved, from, when I moved from England to here, we shipped everything we owned to Nepal, with the idea that we would be in this country for two years. And two years became three years, and four years, and after four years, and you really get into research and you know uh, all that. There is no way you can go back to Nepal <laughs> because that was it. You know, I think you get bitten by the research bug and uh, and, and and scientific interests and things like that. And, uh, uh, I think uh, most of my sisters, particularly younger ones, ended up going to college in Nepal. Yeah, so by the time I left, I think there were several colleges had been established, uh, women's college, and so there was the expectation, at least among <coughs> in, in certain social circles, that the children would go to college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so there was a, there was this kind of a expectation and emphasis on learning, and that's yeah. So my uh, my other one of my other sisters teaches or taught at the university for several years. Uh, um, the sister who went to Germany, she ended up being director of the archaeology department and then became the secretary. And many of our colleagues who have been to Nepal know her because she takes them everywhere. And whenever, whenever, wherever she goes to, you know, to some archaeological place, some palace or another, all that, you know, and I think uh, you know, she can take them to places where most people would not be allowed to. And so people like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, you, you, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. You and Anna Maria. Anna Maria and well, people from Whitehead, you know, Rick and, and, and uh, Rudy and uh, uh, Paul and uh, many people have, have been there and met my sister, met my family. In fact, you know, my, my father used to tell Anna Maria that, you know, I mean, I'll be here next year. <laughs> 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 and uh, so. Has there ever been any uh, pressure put on you to go back to Nepal to uh, organize uh, something educationally and higher education in Nepal? Well, they, they invite me. 
and every so often I'd gone back, uh, you know, uh, there's, a, there's even a thing called Royal Nepal Academy of Science, <laughs> believe it or not. But uh, I go back and I, I, I get disappointed uh, at how little gets done in spite of what you, you say or do or things like that. So, uh, so I, th I think, you know, that's, uh, of course, they, they would want me to go back and see what I can do for them, but it's, it doesn't happen, so I think. I'm kind of resigned to the fact that I'll do my best here, and that you know that's. Uh, <coughs> Angelica, right here. There's a seat right here. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. yeah. <laughs> did you did you have any language issues? Did you think it was your way to college education? Okay. Yeah. So. Language issues. Uh, uh, I grew up, uh, I, I, I can't say I speak English very well, but I grew up speaking English. Uh, in college, college teaching was English. In, in Nepal, yeah, in Nepal. College at home, no. No, no, at home I spoke, I, I spoke the language, Nepalese language, because my, my mother doesn't speak English, for instance. So. Um, but my father could speak English, and he, in fact, would speak in English to, to some, some visitors. Uh, but, uh, yeah. But I, I had a, uh, the person who taught uh, me English uh, was, uh, he was also a teacher of English at the school where I went. And he was also related to me. And he had a son. He had a son who became a real buddy of mine at, at school. And so uh, he eventually ended up being a physicist, taught at the un went to England to do a PhD and taught at, at the university in, in, in Nepal all the time. But so I used to really uh, visit his house and uh, get tutored in English a lot. So in terms of early education, grammar, and things like that, I think I got some guidance there. Uh, but that's really it. You know, otherwise, uh, it's, it's spending years in, uh, of, in England and here. Well, that's, uh, yeah, interesting question. Uh, so uh, I think the short answer to that is no. Uh, and the reason for it is that I am married to an English woman. And so w when we came here, you know, we did not could not go back to, uh, to Nepal for many, many years. But my son is, oldest son, is very attached to Nepal. Yeah, he's, he was 27 years old when I took him home, and he was incredibly struck at what he saw. And he was incredibly impressed uh, by the fact that I could make it to MIT. <laughs> from, from there, from there. And so, so, but he has been there on his own many, many times. Uh, and so he, I think, he likes Nepal. He feels at home there with, the, with, the, with the, this big, big family there. The, the Rasbandari clan is about 300 plus strong. Uh, so we, you know, we, we, we are all Rasbandaris because all, you know, the, 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 the great, great uh, grandfather, whatever, had seven children. And so everybody is, is a Rasbandari. Everybody stayed f until the 20 years ago in the same compound. And so I think uh, when Bob Weinberg visited uh, a few years ago, he saw this uh, uh, area. And I'm interested, Tom, uh, <laughs> about. Uh, you know, you had a nice, secure position in Wisconsin, yeah. faculty position. <clears throat> what were the factors that uh, led you to uh, uh, accept the offer to come to MIT? Mm. <clears throat> well, I've already said it. <laughs> we can turn down MIT. <laughs> well, no, I think, uh, you know, actually, we did think a lot about it. Because uh, one is that the children were really happy there. Uh, and you know, it's a lovely place to, to live. Uh, and secondly, you know, Govin and I had worked together for so many years, and the fact that Govin was moving here and I was moving here, I consulted with many, many people uh, as to whether this was a wise thing to do. There's some who said, no, 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 you should do not, not do that. You know, you've been asso you, your name will forever be associated with Govin's name. You know, you shouldn't do it. <laughs> and others said, you know, I mean, MIT is a great place. You'll establish your own program, and. Uh, Wisconsin did not make it easy. And I have, to, I have not told you this. Wisconsin offered me tenure. 
when they, know, when they knew that you know, <laughs> I was likely to move. Uh, and so that did not make it easy. Uh, but uh, I still, and I think after a lot of thought, uh, decided that this was the best place well, to be. Time, when you made the decision to come here, Gobin had already decided to come here. Is that right? Gobin had not decided, no. Gobin had not decided. In fact, I'll tell you now honestly that Gobin, when I decided, Gobin was very happy. And then we celebrated that night, uh, dinner, four of us, Esther and, and John and Gobin and I. Yeah, so this was, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I think he, uh, he had not decided. To, to come. Yeah. Well, we were lucky. Well, no, I, I, no, you're not lucky. I am lucky. I, I, have, I have enjoyed every minute of it. You know, I, mean, I think teaching has been a, a challenge, but interesting. It's all with teaching is, I tell everybody, teaching is a learning experience. And every time I teach something, I learn. You know, I, mean, I think biochemistry, I have to tell you, when Gene told me, took me to his office and told me that I would be teaching biochemistry with him, I had not taken a biochemistry course in my life. <laughs> and yet, I had to teach biochemistry with Gene. Uh, at fairly short notice, I think. I don't think I got a year, Gene. <laughs> I think it was pretty short notice, yeah. But, you know, I think I looked at Vernon's notes, and I thought I could handle protein chemistry and protein structure and function, and nucleic acid chemistry and structure and function, and transcription, translation, replication, and so on. Uh, and it was, yeah, and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun, Gene, teaching with you and l knowing how, learning how to teach. Uh, you know, and Gene is very fussy. One of the things about Gene is, Gene has his exams prepared at least two weeks beforehand, and uh, I am a, a total procrastinator. I, you know, leave it till the last day, maybe, <laughs> maybe the day before. Uh, and there was one time I almost did not make it. And that was, I was in England, and I was on my way back, and uh, I had left my exam questions for the secretary to type. Uh, but uh, I had not finalized it. And the exam was going to be the day after I arrived back. And this was the day that uh, the uh, Lockerbie uh, accident. Yeah, the, the, the uh, yeah, and, uh, the, a plane that took off from off from London uh, blew up over Scotland, and uh, remember my daughter absolutely petrified because she had heard the news that plane from London had uh, you know been uh, exploded, and uh, I had just called from London to tell her that I was getting on the plane. <laughs> I told her that because she had my car, and I needed the car to come to MIT <laughs> after I arrived so that I could look at the exams and finalize the exams. <laughs> but fortunately, uh, I was on the right plan and uh, got here, did the exams, and uh, was very, very thankful. And I think you know, I should learn from that that I should never leave the exams till the <laughs> last minute. Uh. So, well, looking back, maybe also for the young people in the audience, when you look back when you set up your lab, when you started out as you know, yeah. a bit position now, sort of the other side of the fence, 30 yeah. years later. Yeah. Okay. Do you think it's harder now, or it's the same, or? Uh, oh, that is, uh, yeah, that's a difficult question to answer. Was it hard for me? I, I, I'll tell you what I did. Uh, the first, uh, when I arrived here, the first thing I did was to hire a technician. Yeah, I had been personally working in the lab myself a lot, so I think I knew, you know, I think, which is what the situation is with all, uh, all of our junior colleagues here, that they're also, you know, very much hands-on, have been hands-on. <clears throat> so the first thing I did was to hire a technician. Uh, I, Gene and Boris, Boris was the head and Gene was the associate head. They told me that there was one lab that was, uh, that had all kinds of equipment. Uh, this was a lab emptied by uh, Bernie Gould, Who's the other uh, uh, person? Uh, Cecil Hall. Cecil Hall. Cecil Hall, Bernie Gould, and uh, one other person, Frank Smith. Francis Smith. Yeah. yeah. All, everything had been put into one lab, so I had access to anything I wanted there. Old, old equipment, glassware, everything. So that's what I had, and I had a total of seventy-five thousand dollars spread over three years as my start-up package. That's what I had. 
Uh, At that time, that was a fair yeah, amount. Yeah, I <laughs> see, <laughs> he's very defensive. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, see, I shouldn't say things like this. <laughs> the the, the, the provo Yes. <laughs> yeah. so, we were fortunate that I got no start on yeah. it. And I taught biochemistry from the moment I hit the ground. Yeah, yeah, okay. No yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, yeah. So maybe I shouldn't say a startup package because it was. The, I was told that I would have access to some funds that the provost had. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was. And the provost was uh, 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 Jerry Wiesner. Jerry Wiesner was the provost at that time. And uh, so, okay. So uh, to go back to start. Yeah. So I hired a technician, and I think the first year I got three students, two from biology and one from chemistry. And uh, uh, trained the technician first, worked together with the, was able to work together with the students in spite of having to teach biochemistry. <laughs> and uh, once they got going, uh, life became much easier. And uh, it became a delight, in fact, you know, to go into the lab. And Mehmet Simsek was my first student. Uh, uh, yeah, and Joyce Heckman, and Jim Ziegenmeyer from chemistry. Mehmet would be there smiling, and he, they were running all kinds of Autorad. They would run two-dimensional gels, two-dimensional fingerprints, and there would be huge autorads. And he would be smi looking, smiling, with looking at the pattern and trying to tell me what the latest results was. And that is the joy of research to me. You know, every morning I would come to the lab, and there would be somebody with some result that they wanted to show me. And so it was a very, you know, you work together with the, with the students uh, a lot. And actually, you know, uh, I did not have a postdoc until until I got tenure, I think. I think I got tenure in 1973. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. I didn't get. Uh, yeah, didn't have a postdoc. So all with the students, and it was. It was not a struggle for me. I enjoyed it immensely. Now, is it a struggle for our <laughs> our young guys? I think you know, they will probably have to answer that. Uh, there were no money wars. If you wanted a grant, you had a grant. Oh, I did not have much, much grant at that time. You know, I started with one NIH grant. Uh, then I got, I got three, four years after I got a Cancer Society grant. And uh, grants were small. I think my first grant was twenty-five thousand dollars, or something like that. Direct cost twenty-five thousand dollars. <throat> No, I don't believe I had to pay tuition for the graduate students uh, at that time. By 72. Uh, 69 oh, is when I started. Yeah. MIT was charging for tuition. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I think uh, the tuitions, uh, somehow I managed it. I don't know how, but somehow I managed it. But it may well be. And I, I remember, you know, paying all kinds of exorbitant, what I thought was all kinds of exorbitant sums to MIT <laughs> <laughs> from the grant. But that's, you know, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, I think, yeah, I, I think it was, uh, we, have to, we have to pay our part of our salary, of course, uh, from the grant, uh, which is, you know, not half as bad as what some medical student uh, uh, medical schools do, where you have to pay 100 percent of your salary from your grant. Mm. So it was a breeze. Well, I would not. I would not. Say, it, was, it, was, it was not a breeze. I think I was very naive, uh, Angelica. Because I'll tell you some of the things that maybe I shouldn't say here. Uh, I uh, I never thought of tenure. Mm -hmm. To me, the challenge was just to do the best that you can, teach as well as you can. And just keep your lab going. And I was so, so just gung ho on, on the lab and what was going on in the lab and wanted to keep it going that I did not worry about tenure. And I, in fact, you know, I, the, the first I heard about my tenure was when I walked into the headquarters. It was a faculty meeting for one kind or another. A very small room. People were sitting on the floor. I remember that. And Boris says, Congratulations. I had no clue what the congratulations was about. <laughs> and it just, then it said that you know, the academic council had approved my tenure. That's the first I heard about my tenure. Uh, uh, so uh, so I, you know, I was completely out of it. I was very 
maybe naive, <laughs> or just too, too, you know, just uh, concerned about just going to lab, going and and going to teaching, going. Uh, and then uh, I think that was a time when we had a, a visiting committee meeting, and at the visiting committee dinner that night, Rosenblatt was the provost. Rosenblatt told me that congratulations, we just approved your <laughs> tenure today. So that's when I heard about my tenure. That's how I heard about my tenure. Yeah. So. So yeah, I think I did not worry. Maybe I, I was naive, you know, and uh, and. Uh, but things moved on. A research program got established, uh, and uh, I think, and I didn't stay with TRNA all the time. You know, one thing leads to another, as as you know in research. That you know, we went got in, interested in mitochondrial biology for a while. Again, going from the TRNA, we you know the lab developed. People in the lab really deserve a lot of credit for it. They developed techniques for uh, sequencing tRNAs because the techniques that were available were just not you know, good enough. Very sensitive techniques that led us to look at tRNA that ordinarily one could not look at, like mitochondrial tRNAs, chloroplast tRNAs, messenger RNAs, got us into messenger RNA analyses. Uh, the first mitochondrial tRNA was, give, was so surprising you know, results, showed so many unusual features, we became interested in mitochondrial genes that led to interest in nuclear mitochondrial coordinations, gene regulations, and things like that. And you know, that, ha that lasted about 15 years, and without a grant on it. I, I was still using my main grant to support all that research. And uh, I think uh, uh, we had, at that time, uh, 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 many students were interested in working on mitochondria, mitochondria. So I think that's how I kept that program going. through. Milk mostly through students, really. And the postdocs who came could bring their own money uh, because that was you know, an interesting uh, project at the time. And uh, then we became interested in, well, uh, one thing I should say is to, to young faculty is that you know, sabbatical is one of the best things you know, that we have here. Is when I, 1975, after six years of being here, I got sabbatical and went to England for a year. And that's really what changed my program because I learned. I went there to learn suppressor genetics, and I really thought that that helped my research program a lot. And that, in, in fact, where Bob was there at that time uh, uh, at the MRC labs, yeah. And uh, Bob soon joined us. <coughs> so sabbatical. And unfortunately, I really have not you know, stayed with taking sabbaticals. Uh, because that, that was the first one whole year sabbatical, and the only other sabbatical I took was a trip to Japan that, where I took for two months. And that was the most enjoyable thing again because I was working in the lab, you know, it was working in the lab, working in the lab, and just, uh, and I was just talking to Carolina, who was in the back here uh, in, the, in the lab, that, you know, one of the things faculty really miss is working in the lab, doing your own thing, you know, that, uh, uh, but then we get too busy doing it, <laughs> doing other things equally important. So uh, who is to say, you know? But I, uh, I still envy, envy, envy the faculty who work in the lab. Mary Lou, Frank Solomon used to work in the lab. Uh, uh, you know, and I think uh, it's, it's, I'm sure our, our young junior faculty who work in the lab. They'll, they'll, I'm sure they enjoy it a lot. Uh, yeah. I think Tom, in the years I've known you, I think as much as anyone at MIT, you've been a little oasis of happiness and cheerfulness and yeah. at least relative calm. Yeah. And I just wondered if you'd say a few words, because how you balance the rest of your life. I know family's been important to you, and most of you don't yeah. know he's an awesome squash yeah. player. <laughs> so I wondered if you'd say a few words how you balance that in the professional uh, life. I think. Uh, well, again, I have to go back to my father. Uh, one thing I learned from my father is that, you know, uh, never be angry. If you're angry at someone, try to think of why this person is behaving the way he or she is behaving. And that means that, you know, I, it, it makes you think before you say anything uh, in, in anger and things like that. And that gives you time to reflect. And that, I think, is, is, is incredibly useful. 
you know, to, to time to reflect. And if you're angry, not to say anything, but just think, why, why is this guy doing whatever he or she is doing? What are they doing? So that helps a lot, you know, I think. And the other thing I have learned to do, and something I've felt essential to do, is that never take work home. Uh, that doesn't mean not to work at home. Never take you know, the, the problems that you have at work and all that. Never let that affect your behavior at home. And vice versa, never let the problems at home, which there are many always, bring, bring that to the lab and affect your behavior in the lab. The, the two should stay completely separate. And that, I think, has, to me, helped a lot. Plus, the fact that I really have wonderful colleagues and wonderful students, and it's, it's, it's much better to, to be cheerful and have a happy face than, <laughs> than uh, otherwise. Uh, I think it's just, you know, it's, it's one of these things you do. You learn, it's, it's almost a survival instinct, if you like. Yeah. Did any of your children become scientists? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, think that, I, I think they saw how much of a commitment it was it required to be a scientist, I think. Uh, my son, my oldest son, is an architect. Oh, not architect, I'm sorry. Um, he went to Arts Institute. And so he uh, uh, is in California. And uh, my daughter, uh, she went to uh, California, didn't like it. <laughs> so when she finished school, came back. And she, she went into banking. And now she has a small business of her own. So, but they still follow or try to follow what I do, or, or at least try to show an interest in what I do. <laughs> yeah. So what else can I say? Is there any questions? Any other questions? I'm certainly happy to answer. But uh, you know, I think it's just it's been a uh, uh, life of fun. It's still wonderful to do science. And I still hope that I can continue to do science uh, and continue to teach and uh, be, be here in the department and, uh, and enjoy being with my colleagues. And you are currently associate head of the department. <coughs> uh, do you like that? Do I like it? <laughs> yeah. I think it's, it's wonderful to be useful. Uh, 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 Chris has been very kind to me. Uh, and so he has really shouldered most of the burden himself. Uh, but it, it, nevertheless, it's, I think it's good to be useful uh, and to feel that, you know, I think one of the things I have to, in answer to Angelica's question, has you know, life been? You know, just easy for me. Uh, I think I have always f asked myself the question, do I belong here? That is a question that you ask when you come here. That's a question I still ask. Do I still belong here? Because I think the day you don't ask that question, you, you don't belong here anymore. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. So uh, I think, therefore, it's, it's, it's good to feel that you are doing something for the department, for the greater good of the institute. What's more important to me is some, doing something good for the department. Uh, and to serve in any way that one can, and to the best of one's ability, I think. Uh, right answer. Right answer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but, uh, but, but you know, I, mean, I think, I, once again, I have to say that it's really been a joy. It's been a joy to, to teach so many smart students and uh, uh, to have so many people in the lab who have contributed so much and uh, just uh, uh, has, have kept my uh, research program going, uh, and to interact with so many colleagues who just you know, are always helpful, supportive, and uh, just uh, work together well. Yeah. Talk in a little more detail about the early tRNA work. Early tRNA work. Ah, OK. So what was the can I talk a little bit about the early tRNA work? OK, so one of the, one of the things that really thrilled me was uh, to sequence one of the tRNAs by myself. OK? Uh, that was the yeast phenylalanine tRNA. This is the one that everybody has done, crystallography and all that stuff. 
And John Abelson, when he came here to give a seminar, said that he doesn't know how on earth I found out, I identified all those modified bases in those, that, that particular tRNA. Uh, but so uh, we had developed some methods in Gobin's lab to tag uh, ends of uh, nucleic acids. And so that's really what you know, uh, allowed us to begin uh, tagging, chemical tagging now. And then when uh, polynucleotide kinase came, then we could tag it enzymatically. And so that is what allowed us to develop new techniques that could really be, you know, in other words, instead of using, making, purifying grams of tRNAs, which we had to do in, in Madison, grams of tRNAs, and take, to take three months to purify a tRNA, for instance. You know, none of this affinity chromatography stuff these days. <laughs> and and, and uh, so that allowed us to really look at minute amounts of tRNAs. And we could just fragment it, label it, and, and then use the label to sequence it. You know, in much the same way, same principles as Fred Sanger used to synthesize, sequence insulin in the first place. Same general principles. So, but sequencing a tRNA was really, you know, to me, the delight was, I was telling Carolina just the other day that uh, we used to use chromatography to identify modified nucleotides. That's the only way you could do it, you know, chromatography and spectroscopy. Uh, and one of the systems we used was a solvent system called isobutyric acid ammonia water. Now, those of you who are chemists know that isobutyric acid is just a horrendously awful <laughs> smelling stuff. And who used it first? You might be surprised, Boris Magasani. In Shargaff's lab, when they were, when they were, uh, uh, they were quantitating the base contents of DNA. Uh, so we used that. And I remember going to a Christmas party uh, one night uh, uh, in Gobin's house, Christmas party. And my last bit of data that I needed to establish the sequence was in that chromatogram. Now, those of you who don't, have not ever used paper chromatography, this is a paper about this wide, about this tall. And it's drenched with isobutyric acid, OK? <laughs> so I get dressed. My wife is already at the party. I get dressed and, and go and take the chromatograph out. And I, I was not going to leave it to dry. I was going to look under the UV to see where the spots were <laughs> so I could identify what the, what the spots were. Because by that time, I knew what, what ran where, everything else. And so I went to the party. I, I knew the answer. I was really thrilled. I went to the party. and. People would <laughs> so, so, you know, I remembered very, very vividly that, and uh, feeling a little uncomfortable, but also really, really giddy about, about about having the final data that I needed to, and that I, th I have to tell you was a lot of work. And uh, again, you know, the, Jack Buchanan told me we published six papers on that back to back in JBC. And, uh, and Jack Buchanan told me that when he saw those papers, he was convinced that you know, they should hire me. <laughs> so, uh, so that was the early days. And then one thing led to another, and we, we started working with initiated tRNAs. And uh, then we, that has so many unusual features that then we asked whether this was un unique to all initiated tRNAs. And that led to collaboration with Mike Smith and all those guys. And then that led to work with uh, uh, mitochondrial tRNAs, chloroplast tRNAs, globin messenger. My f first two postdocs worked with me on globin messages. That's another collaboration with David Baltimore, my postdoc collaborator with David Baltimore on the first cDNA synthesis, because globin messenger was the only purified message that was available then. And so they, therefore, uh, Inder Verma in David's lab use reverse transcriptase to make this first cDNA ever. So that was a collaboration with David Baltimore, with, with my postdoc, Gary Temple. <clears throat> so it's, you know, it's been a lot of, a lot of nice, nice collaborations. In the, and people like Graham right down the hall, and just, you know, just <clears throat> Mary Lou next door, Corbin. Bob, two floors down, and so you know, oh, just, just just wonderful. And I think this this new building is a is a great building. And I think it was just. I have to tell you, you probably don't know that in the old building, I was not in the main biology building. I was in the chemistry building, building 18, but attached to to biology through the bridge, the fifth floor bridge. 
And when I first moved to biology, my office was next door to the headquarters, 56503, which is the biology building. And my lab for the first year was in biology. Then when Gobin arrived and the, and, and the, uh, the building was finished, then I moved uh, to, to the uh, Gobin, to the whole floor, was Gobin and I had the whole floor uh, of building 18, fifth floor. Uh, So lots of memories. Most of them good, I hope. They're all very good. They're all very good. I think you know. I mean, there's. I mean, life throws its curves, but you know. But I think uh, you learn to go with it, and uh, they've been very good. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for coming. This is really wonderful to have see you all. Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat>